is your president speaking and welcome to the virtual Bramham Pins in the Park event. We've got a great lineup for you and I hope you're going to enjoy it because sadly a lot of the big events in the equestrian calendar have obviously been cancelled this year. But uh, we thought we'd take you behind the scenes to find out what it is that makes them just so special, special, didn't we, Lizzie, apart from me not being able to speak. <laughs> it's the BHS's favourite double act, Martin. It wouldn't be the same. If we We're on the speak. road next year. That's <laughs> going to be great. Have you ever been to Bramham before, Martin? I have not. No, no. It's, it's really lovely. fantastic. It is, is lovely. It? It's so lovely. We're, we're going to, you and I, we're going to go next year. We're going to. Oh, watch. okay, that's a date. But what, what makes it so special? Well, it's special because it's a beautiful parkland and we'll come on to the house in a second because I got a little tour from the owner which was amazing but the competition is really really tough it's like a sort of um scaled down badminton I think Ian Stark's the course designer and he he's known for his really tough courses so the competition is amazing there are three main competitions there's the long format four star the short format four star and then there's an under 25 which is really hotly contested so you've got the kind of advantage of that and then there's loads of other stuff going on there's sort of showing and the, the shops are amazing as well but as I said I got a private tour of the house I'm sure it's like your house actually Martin I'm sure it's I'm sure your house is just as grand but the pictures and Nick Lane Fox who owns it he, he took me up to the roof because we were filming we were filming there and I went to go kind of all these little nooks and crannies and they've got beautiful paintings and the Lane Fox family, obviously very famous family anyway, and the heritage there is incredible. So you and I are going to go next year and we're going to see if we can speak to Nick and see if we can get a private tour. But just oh, for great. you guys now watching, we caught up with Nick Lane Fox and also Nick Pritchard, who is the estate manager at Bramham. And this is what they had to say. So Bramham Horse Trials is an absolutely fantastic event. It's known by our members as the Badminton of the North. Sadly, as event manager, it isn't one I've yet been to. I was really hoping to get there this year, but it just wasn't to be. However, we are lucky enough to be speaking to Nick Lane Fox, the owner of Bramham Park, and Nick Pritchard, event director, um, about Bramham itself. So who better to tell us some more? The, the estate's been in my family for 300 years. Um, a chap called Robert Benson, who was uh, Queen Anne's um, Lord Chancellor, uh, built it, uh, started in about 1698, and he carried on laying out the house and garden uh, until about 1731 when he died. And um, I think I'm the 10th generation uh, of his descendants to uh, to carry it on. We've been through sort of divorces and, uh, and, and illegitimate children and all sorts, and a fire in 1828. Um, the house was unoccupied for 80 years, but then my great grandparents rebuilt in about 1906. And um, we're carrying on, hopingly, hoping to keep it going for the next 300 years. That's fantastic. Um, as to my equestrian background, um, I, I was I was in the pony club and um, you know um, hunted and that sort of thing and uh, evented, and then I was in the army in the household cavalry, so I rode a certain amount uh, then. And then my father started the event in 1974. Um, he. Well, actually, funnily enough, my grandparents were approached when when Harwood used to have a three-day event, uh, Harwood House, uh, which finished, I think, in about 1961 or 62, when they had a there was a there was a foot and mouth outbreak, and um, they didn't want the event to come back to Harwood after the foot and mouth outbreak, and so the then BHS, who then ran all the events, uh, approached my grandparents and said, "Would they like to have an event?" Um, and they said, "No, not they didn't really want to have it," and that's when Burley started. They went to Burley instead. So they could have started a lot earlier. That's, that's incredible. The history of these events is just absolutely amazing. Nick, you have a lot of events here. Are you from an equestrian background too? Is that how you got into it? And um, how does the organisation work? It's just a massive event to put on. Um, when do you start? When do you start planning? Um, I'm taking your first question first. I'm not from an equestrian background at all. Um, I rode as a child, but but no more than that. I think I, I stopped riding when I was about 13. Um, my primary role at Bramham is I'm the estate manager. Uh, right. And I took over running the estate in 2008. Um, and it was decided in 2009 that the running of the horse trials would become part of my, uh, part of my role as well. So um, from a fairly non-horsey background, um, I was suddenly running one of the biggest equestrian events in the country, which was a, a bit of an eye-opener. Fortunately, we have a, an excellent team here and an amazing army of volunteers and officials 
um, who help put on the event every year. And as Nick's just said, um, it's been running since 1974. So we've got a pretty good template built up over these last 40 odd years, which I just sort of flesh out a little bit every year, but um, couldn't do it without all, the, all of the, the help from the, the team we have around us, all of our officials and volunteers. And I think last year we had 550 um, throughout the event in total. So it really is an army of people that helped me put on the event. Um, and it's it's great fun, it's, it, it's, it, it's massive. And so I think not coming from an equestrian background hasn't hampered things too much. Um, and and, it, and we really enjoy putting it on. It's a, it's a great event. That's fantastic. What So what do you think, to both of you really, what do you think that makes Bramham Park such a special event? I mean, I, I think, um, I, I echo Nick's, Nick's thing, that the, the, the effort that he and and the team of volunteers put in um, is it really makes it makes it uh, what it is, and and uh, competitors always say that 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 the team of volunteers are very friendly here, which I I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's very nice that if they are, and I hope that they they feel they're part of a something that's been you know running for over 40, 40 something years now, so um, it, that they feel a, a real sense of belonging to it. I think just adding to what Nick's just said about friendly, I think for me that's one of the sort of the biggest things is. I think Bramham's a, a friendly event and we've got a, a lovely team and it's it sort of is driven from from the top. I mean, Nick and his his father are really, really, really friendly um, and, and so nice to work with. And that sort of filters down through the event. So we're then all trying to, to, to keep it as a sort of a, a family friendly um, event for, for the competitors and for the spectators and sponsors alike. I'm going to sneak one more question in just to throw you all off the guard a bit. Um, any particular special, event, uh, special memories, special moments that really stick in your mind uh, Nick to Nick Pritchard first? I've got a sort of a, a personal one rather than sort of an event specific one due to some sort of poor um, family planning I suppose on my part. My first child was born 10 days before the 2016 <laughs> horse trial so we sort of got to the stage about a, you know 10 days before and sort of to my wife you come on we really need to have the baby now because I've got a, a fairly big event to go and run um, unfortunately she was very obliging and uh, and gave birth 10 days before so I sort of met the baby saw her and then came rushing into work and, and ran a massive, massive horse trials and then sort of caught up with the wife and baby afterwards so I think for me that was a, a personal highlight it was a, quite a fun way to, to, to have an event I suppose and, and a great start for Rufus. <laughs> Amazing. And Nick? Uh, I, I remember particularly um, uh, in the army, I worked in France at the French riding school for a year and uh, uh, we had a French uh, member of the grand jury one year who, who didn't speak uh, any English. And so I had to be the, uh, his writer for the dressage tests and translating his French into English. And then I, I had the, 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 the proper writer sitting behind me who, who translated my English translation into dressage speak. So we, we, it was a very, very entertaining two days of, uh, of, 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 of translating French, French equestrian terms into English, proper, proper dressage sheet um, English. Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you both very much. That's so interesting. It's just wonderful to get a behind the scenes glimpse into what goes into organising this amazing event. We really look forward to being back with you. We're really looking forward to, 20, to 2021. Nick and Nick really enforced the importance of volunteers there and nobody knows how important volunteers are more than the British Horse Society, eh Lizzie? They're absolutely the lifeblood of it. It just couldn't function in the way that it does without its army of volunteers. Uh, and at Bramham, we would be saying thank you and presenting um, some long service awards to various uh, um, volunteers. But we can't do that this year, obviously, as we can't be all together. So we're going to take this opportunity to salute and hail various individuals for their support to society. And for 15 years service, Georgina Hartley, and Denise and Nigel Robinson for 10 years. We salute you and we thank you. We do, well done to them, 15 years. Now, uh, regional chairs, of course, are the kind of people who organize all those volunteers. So they're the sort of the, I don't know, what would you call it, Martin? Would they be the colonels or the majors? Or maybe you're the colonel, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, they're, they're in charge, aren't they, the regional chairs? <laughs> Absolutely. And so we've been talking to the regional chair for Yorkshire, who's called Ruth Baxter, and the regional manager for Yorkshire, Amy Clements. So here we are, Ruth, what would have been cross country day of, of Bramham Horse Trials. I know we both, it's an event we really look forward to. Um, I'm particularly going to miss it this year. Just It just feels 
very strange that it's not happening, but we are where we are. Um, I just love it, I think, because it's the one of the biggest events in the north of England for people. Um, I almost can refer to it as a the badminton of the north, really, because I really do think it's up there with, with the best of them. How do you feel about it? Definitely. I mean, it's great to have such a such a big scale event in Yorkshire that attracts so many top riders, so many famous faces, but also has the opportunity for so many people from our region and beyond to, to come and visit. And there's so much that we can do, you know, when we get settled into our little corner trade stand down at Bramham and uh, yeah. invite all our members to join us. And, and the fact that they've got that opportunity to come in on the Friday evening and join us for our tea party and, and they don't have to pay to get into Bramham for that. So we're able to, to welcome so many people in and catch up with so many members and friends of the BHS. Yeah, I agree. It's it's going to be such a shame. And of course, we won the prestigious um, Silver Award last year for our trade stand that has been ever evolving over the last few years um, to incorporate the tea parties that I know have been really popular. So, um, But we'll be big, back bigger and, and better next year, I think. Um, I hope but so. It's, it's great to be able to have both the, the stand and the lorry out on course as well, which is so popular uh, when we offer teas and coffees to, to the riders course walking and definitely a refreshment pit stop for, for people walking their dogs around the cross country. I think we're definitely the place to be for dogs on course at Bramham. Yeah, definitely. That would have been today, of course. But hey ho, next year, look, we look forward to it. Um, just wanted to touch as well on the fact that um, not all sad because hopefully all been well and fingers crossed we'll be able to hold our Ride Out UK um, pleasure ride later on this year in October at, at the Bramham Park Estate. As you know they've been great supporters of the BHS um, so that will be a really, a really great event. I know everybody will look forward to that. Um, so yeah we'll keep our fingers crossed that that will go ahead. Definitely. The, um, the other things that's been happening in the region, um, we've done a little bit with some money that was left uh, by a kind lady called Irene Heppel. Having that Irene Heppel fund in the region that's been able to support some of the older horses and ponies that are often the backbone of a riding school has been a real boost. So we were very lucky this year to receive a grant from the British Horse Society to help us look after our older horses while the COVID-19 crisis has been on. So, like many centres, we found ourselves uh, with no income at all, really having to look at our expenses, and obviously our older horses do cost a lot more to keep because they're all on different supplements, uh, they need more rugs, they need more care, uh, lots of small feeds and the best grass. Uh, so, it was a really difficult time. Um, but thanks to the BHS and the grab, that was so helpful for us so we could carry on looking after our own horses that play such a vital role in our life and So thank you very much to the BHS. Um, we've also tried to use the, the social media to just give a boost to, to some of our centres and some of the work that the BHS do so that we can raise a little bit of awareness ready for a time when we can get back to some sort of normality. Yeah, and hopefully you know, things are looking positive, we're, we're coming out of the other side of it now, so fingers crossed it, it keeps continuing to improve for everybody and especially for those centres, yeah. And um, so we'll be able to welcome everybody back to, to Bramham this time next year. Yeah, definitely, we hope to see you all soon, hopefully we might see some of you in October at the ride, get your entries in early if you do see that it's advertised because places may be limited this year. Um, and yeah, we will be back uh, bigger and better for 2021. We'll see you all then. Uh, well, that's amazing and uh, uh, great to hear how the uh, Irene Happel Fund has been used to support the approved riding centres during this tricky time. Now, Martin, I want to talk about dressage with you because okay. I'd quite like to see you doing dressage on your great big horses down there in Dorset. Have you ever tried it? I, I have actually. I, I did it on one at Ronnie, the the should we say naughtier of the two more spirited maybe um we did one of the bhs online dressage tests um and, and i think it's fair to say that we we mastered uh rising walk uh, 
<laughs> he, he was pretty belligerent. But his brother, Bruce, um, we went up, uh, um, uh, British Dressage brilliantly uh, opened up a draft horse class up at, um, oh, where was it? Anyway, it was up there. Uh, and um, we went up a couple of years in a row. And what, what was, I mean, he did really well, Bruce. He did really, really well. We usually have a photo of him doing it here, but it's been moved. When you say um, a couple of levels in a row, what do you mean? Were you doing meetings? No, a couple of a couple of years in a row. Oh, a couple God. of years in a row. I thought Nothing you were. To... <laughs> I thought you were kind of watching way through the levels. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, I stress it wasn't it wasn't me riding. It was it was uh, Chloe our groom, who's a wonderful rider. Um, I don't think she quite signed up for Clydesdale dressage when she came to work for us, but she did it brilliantly. And he did brilliantly as well. But the best thing about it was, I thought it was so great the British dressage to open up like that because you went there, there was Icelandic ponies. There were all these weird, but adored, cherished, primped and pampered animals. Um, do, you know, trying their little hearts out at dressage. It was a lovely thing to see. But um, I've, I've had a few lessons. Dress. Dressage is my wife's thing, and um, you know I, 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 I I'm not pretty, and neither are my animals. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> I can't profess to be very good at dressage, and I've got a rare breed, so maybe I could see if I could get my rare breed into the British dressage crazy. Oh yeah. Category. Um, but I'm not very good. But what it's fascinating, I think, the difference between eventing dressage and pure dressage, and just how yes. good the eventers have got these days. I mean, in the old days, you know, they weren't. I mean, they were still a lot better than me, but you know, they. They weren't necessarily known for their dress size. There were certain riders yeah. that were very good, but there is obviously quite still though quite a big difference between eventing dressage and pure dressage. So we've got two of my favourite people from the world of equestrianism together. Dickie Wagert, who's the performance director for Team GB, and the four-time Olympian Richard Davison. And the two of them, who get on very well, are talking about the differences between eventing dressage and pure dressage. Great. So today we've been asked to talk a little bit about the um, difference between uh, horse trials, eventing dressage and pure dressage and a little bit around the complexities there and the way that the horses are trained and the differences. A point I felt that when I spent my time with you guys in the dressage world, it was something that I really, really got my head around is that activation of the hind leg. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is where everybody's gone to. I mean, you, you, if we want to call that as connection, I mean, connection not with an L, but with M's, um, that you can really only connect a horse if your seat, your position, your overall control of your position, your legs, your pelvis and upper body and arms are under your control and do what you intend them to do. And then you obviously have a, a concept of pressure release with horses um, in terms of the physical bit and helping them learn. And if I go back in time, Dickie, and you too, by the way, um, you know, thinking about the badmintons of early of old, and especially when they were on the long format, very different format, perhaps they needed different horses. Did they need different horses or, you know, could we have trained those horses better? I suppose is the answer to that because we've all learned as we've gone along. But you know, they were definitely big jumpers, gallopers, endurance horses. And now what I see with event three day event horses, and obviously we have show jumpers here and dressage horses. You know, the breeding and the biomechanics are all coming very much aligned. It's very hard to point out that just the three day eventer that just goes fast to that could that's a proper sport horse that could do any of these disciplines. Yeah, I think there's there's a few things. I mean, first of all, people understand the limitations of confirmation now and you know how confirmation can affect what a horse can do and its longevity and soundness. So, you know, scoring the marking com confirmation and understanding what you've got to work with. And then I think another big element there is because understanding ways of going, scales of training um, and following those scales. And what I really see in the event horse now is that their top lines are much stronger and they, they've got better core strength. And the, it's no longer good enough to have a horse in an outline. It's got to be in self-carriage. And I think as well, I mean, you know, the age old question, what's the difference between pure dressage and horse trials dressage? But at the end of the day, you're still looking for 
you know, you've still got the scales of training to fall back to. You're still looking when you look at the um, uh, the dressage um, manual and rule book, and um, you're still looking at the same qualities in the, in the movements. You might not, you know, a, a dressage horse, you know, might have around a hind leg, might be better at uh, it, it weightlifting, and the movement can be can be different, but it's still all the same qualities. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. The degree of collection is, is not the same that is required. And when I say that, that the word on the paper saying collected trot or collected canter, the reality is that if you're given a movement, for instance, cantering down the centre line when you first canter into a test, it says collected canter. But not every one of those collected canter strides are actually going to be the same in terms of loading of the hind leg and, and what we call the sitting. The two or three strides before a canter to hold, you increase that collection. And then if you switch over to the dressage horse, you know, clearly when you're starting to do um, Pierre passage canter pirouettes, even one time changes, the spring, as in the up and down move, that the horse has got to um, develop um, or it may have been born if you like with that's in a completely different league to the what is required at that advanced medium um, level test for great britain nikki hill fgh bingo ball James Avery, James with an Optimus Prime, followed by Joe and Alex Janimal, and the combinations that use the Chatsworth International Horse Trials as their preparation for here. So for New Zealand, James Avery, Optimus Prime, the second. But the, the thing that's really struck me about horse trials tests, and I've touched on it just now, is the fact that there's more acceptance or it, it's the norm now that the frames are up and they're out so they can use their head and necks much better. And they all need their head and necks when they're going cross country, head, neck and tail to, to balance themselves. And that's why I also think as well with the, the rideability cross country and the maneuverability of a horse through the correct training on the fat flat has made a huge difference to the to the cross country now with the event horse and the dressage horse with their natural way of if they were at liberty in the arena yes they have different movement but i feel that with the event in dressage now they're understanding how the activation of the hind leg creates the lightness yes they're never going to come to a, into a piaf and pass up but working and understanding how that works within the horse and how to create that lightness is only a good thing in my mind because as I said before it makes it well first of all 
more harmonious. And most importantly, you get rideability into them, uh, into them cross country. And that strength of the, the upper body and using, being able to use their neck and coming into self carriage, then that, that is a massive thing cross country. Then you're not getting time penalties. You're not pulling up in front of every fence. You can come down in a rhythm. Yes, you've got to make fundamental gear changes. A lot of that though, Richard comes back to your balance of the rider because you can make a lot of those gear changes with your weight aids. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to say is it's, it's dangerous that we pigeon whole horses and label them because if you say they're never going to have the same collection as the dressage horse, I mean, obviously we can all think of exceptions. Wiley Trout, for example, started off as, a, as an event horse, an advanced event horse. This is with Chris Carter, remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. He went to dressage and became a very successful Grand Prix Olympic dressage horse. Now, you, we can say there's all those exceptions, but, and you can, you can easily to say, but the thoroughbred horse can't collect and spring up like a warm blood. But what I'm saying is you just got to look at the individual horse and not necessarily um, pigeonhole it. And have you seen the new Olympic uh, test for three day event? No. Yeah. No. Tell me about it. It's a really good test. Um, it's a lot shorter. Um, but there's counter, uh, counter zigzag in there. Um, you know, um, there's, uh, across the long diagonal, um, uh, change at the middle, change at the end. Um, so the intensity of the test is much more. The riders, you know, we, we've seen it ridden and it, and it rides really well. But yes, for an event rider at the moment, it comes on them quite quickly, but, it wouldn't be far off if you had a couple of, uh, you know, uh, pirouettes in there, it wouldn't be far off getting towards the pre-St. George in lots of ways, yeah. um, which is only, only good. And I think that I'd have to say, I think that the, the design of the test, uh, Christoph Hess had a lot to do with writing it, but it, 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 it's very good. It shows the event horse off in the, in the right way and allows you to prepare for, the cross country and for the show jumping on the last way. So that it just, the whole thing is very much link, linked in. It's, good, it's a good test. Stuff. And those the age old debates, you know, event horses versus uh, uh, versus um, dress dressage horses. But an interesting factoid: um, the when a, an, a a dressage horse is at the peak of that is its test, its heart rate is somewhere near what an event horse would be coming through the finishing line, and I find that fascinating. The, the 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 yes it's a different type of it's uh weightlifting and not galloping and endurance but it's incredible to think that 
both those equines are working at the same uh, same heart rate and through their bodies the same. Yeah, I mean, the muscular output, as I'm talking about now at Grand Prix level, is tremendous. And therefore, you know, when you're competing in hot climates or humid, humid climates and, the, you know, big championships and the rest of it, that's why, you know, dressage horses really have to be fit. And, you know, obviously when I'm talking about fit, I'm talking about in the context of the fitness of the work they've got to do and endure for eight minutes. Uh, so an interesting point um, that we sort of touched on um, last time was around, you know, character. And really it's how we get our scales of training and our, our system right at the very beginning that really affects how, you know, the horse's long-term um, ability to be able to perform under pressure. And um, all of that, having a system, knowing how long you need to warm up for to allow the horse to be able to to show expression in the arena, but at the same time, you've got to have relaxation mentally, as we well know, to have su suppleness in the horse physically. And, you know, everything I always say, life's about timing, but it is knowing your horse and knowing what preparation you have, knowing how it, they would soak the atmosphere up in different arenas. And one thing I was um, having, you know, been eventing and then stepping into your world was I was amazed at how some riders wanted the atmosphere with their horses to, to lift them and to keep that intensity to the end of the test. Um, and it, it just opened my eyes to a different way of looking at the horses. And what it's done, what it's, where it's helped me, Richard, is coming back to uh, the eventing world is, is saying to riders I coach, don't be frightened of that of that extra bit of energy and, 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 and exuberance, use it to your advantage. With dressage, with the show jumpers, because obviously that's, you know, what I spend most of the time doing now and with show jumping riders, they're never going to ride a dressage test. So once we get beyond the point of, well, why are we doing dressage? And the standard answer is to give a bit more control, uh, which is obvious, it gives a bit more influence, so you've got more selection of pace and all that. But the other side of it, is to pick up on your point about the horses, you know, being being therapeutic for the horses. I think it's, I'm very, very, you know, obviously pleased to, to hear that. But I mean, I think it keeps the horses sounder. So even if you were never going to do a dressage test with a horse in your life, I think one of the reasons for doing it is a little bit like as we get older, we do keep, keep fit work. And um, not just for cardiovascular, I'm talking about to stimulate muscle cells you know ligament bone cells and all the rest of it that's why we do it and, and it's, is it. it's the best form of physio for the horse so richard basically in essence what riders have got to do at all levels is remember when they're on the horse they are the coach of the horse and you or i might be a guest coach that are invited in once a week to help that combination but fundamentally the rider is the coach of the horse Um, that was really interesting, wasn't it? I, I, I won't profess to have understand all the technicalities of everything that they were talking about, but I particularly like what he said about uh, not pigeonholing our horses. Um, it's all too easy to do, certainly behaviourally, isn't it? Because for a while I went through this phase with Ronnie, uh, who's a bit of a thug, of, of, of coming at him like he was a bit of a thug and go, oh, come on, you, you know, you know. And in actual fact, I've, I've completely changed and sort of not projected that onto him and I'm much softer with him now. Uh, and he still bites me. <laughs> I couldn't have that. I couldn't have one that bites me. When does he bite you? What he What are you doing when he bites he, he you? He doesn't. He just does it with his lip. He's tactile. He's just sort of, he just, um, if I'm leading him in or something, he'll just wander along and just have a little bump like that. But it's just him saying hello. So I pinch him on the neck and we all get on fine. <laughs> My little Welsh cob, actually, my little rescue, Blue Cross Whisper, she tries to sort of nibble me. But again, it's sort of, it's not, there's no malice in it. It's just a, no. but it's quite annoying, isn't it? When you're trying, particularly if you're like, I was, a, we had a, a veterinary issue earlier and I was going to be in my clothing for this very thing. And I thought there's no way I can be in these clothes while I'm out there doing whatever I'm doing because she would have eaten my arm and then I would have <laughs> done it over my top. <laughs> you couldn't 
that could even on a computer screen. I know, but it's quite, it's sort of, I quite like that interaction. I like it when, um, you know, when you pick the front hoof up to pick it out and they start uh, pulling your pants up. <laughs> my, my horse does that to the farrier and it really makes me laugh. Sort of licks his bum. <laughs> so, what's going through their head? <laughs> oh, I'll do this now. <laughs> anyway, talking of sort of clothing, um, we need to talk about the trot up, Martin, because the trot up at Bramham, you know, I said it earlier, it's a bit like a mini Babington. The trot up is a really lovely occasion because obviously it's a it's a three day event. And these days, the trot up is as much about fashion, isn't it, as, as the welfare of the horse. I mean, clearly the whole point of a vet's inspection is for, to make sure that the horse is fit and sound and ready to to kind of take on the rigours of three day eventing. Yes. But we love it, don't we? Because we like looking, well, I like looking at the ladies' boots yes. and jackets and everything. <laughs> so when we go to Brabham next year, we need to go in time to watch the trot up. Have you oh, ever done okay. a trot up? All right. No, I haven't. I haven't. No, no. I'd love to see that. Yeah. But even when you're trotting them up for the for, for a real vet, actually, there for is the an vet. art kind of getting your legs in time with the horse's legs so that the vet can concentrate on the horse's legs and not your legs. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Although I would say I've got very, very good legs and uh, they've frequently distracted judges and one of the too, let me tell you. Um, we do it a bit when I don't show my boys much, but I do it at our fair. I show them and I have to trot up. Yeah, like a good And you have to get those legs in time. Yes. So we've been talking to some of the sponsors from Bramham. We've been talking to Hattie Iansen, who's the sales manager for British Horse Feeds for Speedy Beat. Um, a brand actually i've got one of their gilets which i wear walking around um and also from andrew ransford who is uh, with high ho silver so this is what they had to say um about the trot up at Bramham. hattie andrew thank you so much for joining us today recent years the trot up has just changed entirely in the past it used to be about perfectly turned out horses but now it seems to be almost as much about perfectly turned out riders so Hattie Speedy Beat sponsored the trot up at Bramham in 2019 what what was your what's your affinity with Bramham and, and why the trot up in particular yeah so um British Horse Feeds, obviously, with it being a, we're a family business based in Yorkshire, Bramham's our local event. Uh, so we've been part of Bramham now for over 15 years. Um, we started with sponsoring events. I mean, I personally have been going since I've been a little girl. Um, and then we've sort of gone from there, really. We're now the title sponsor of the under 25 section, which is um, great to watch. And about six years ago, we decided um, to support the inspection area because it's such an exciting part of the event, really. It is about the horse. We mustn't forget that. It's about the horse. And it's about whether it's sound and it's about whether it's healthy. But recognising that the trot up could also be a fashion show effectively for the, all of the trade stands that are actually at the show and I think it's also wonderful to see our riders expressing their 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 personalities through the trot up as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think obviously with the trot up, it's it's a chance for the spectators to get a, a little bit closer to the riders, I guess. One of the ones that sticks in my mind was um, Ben Hobday coming back, having had his battle with cancer. And he came back and he rode, is it Mr... What's the horse with the enormous feet? Mr. Mulroy, I think he is with it. And, yeah, Mr. Mulroy. and there was a hesitation and, and they weren't certain that he was going to pass. And then the judges conferred and he passed and the crowd went bananas. It was like, Ray! <laughs> and a big cheer. And I just thought it's a, such a lovely, lovely atmosphere and everything that you get. And, and, and you're right, this this sort of closeness that you, do, you don't get otherwise. So let's go back to Bramham 2019. You're the sponsors of it. There were some amazing outfits there last year. Who were your favourites? I mean, obviously everyone looked amazing. Um, I, I'd probably have to stay loyal and, uh, and and pick our rider, James. I think he had some bright burgundy trousers, I think. James, I, James I, I, from memory, I think James did very, very well. I'll tell you the ones that stuck in my mind from last year were... Um, um, Ailey Jane Costello, who was wearing this beautiful um, 
blue stripes, almost like she was a Henley type um, jacket. She looked really, really cool. Pippa Funnel, very understated. An Ella and Cherry outfit. Blokes wise, who was our winner there? It was Richard Coney last year was our winner there. It always looks amazing to me and they are just, I particularly, me personally, Nicola Wilson's yellow jacket on the first yep. trot up last year. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that was a winner. <laughs> this year has been a bit strange for all of us. I think the, the issue is none of us know and everything is changing so rapidly. Believe you me, if somebody says there's a show on in five days, we could be there. We are exactly the same. So obviously we're absolutely gutted about about the events, but it's, it's a situation that it is. And I suppose you just got to accept it. And I suppose we're like you, Andrew, if someone said, right, there's an event next weekend, we'd 100% we'd be able to get there straight away. That's brilliant. Thank you so, <laughs> thank you both so much. Trot ups are obviously uh, essential for the sport and for the vets and for the welfare of everybody, but it's a great chance for the spectators to get up close to the riders and the animals moving a little bit more slowly than they do around the cross country course, isn't it? I also think it's amazing how the horses don't seem to be phased. They're just, there's all those people and all that noise and flapping clothing. And uh, and we I, I worked on a charity event recently called Virtual Eventing to raise money for the NHS. And they had a virtual trot up and all the riders were in fancy dress. <laughs> And the horses even then weren't particularly phased, although the lady who wore um, a complete sort of uh, motorbike outfit, she said she had to practice a couple of times with the horses. But these inventors, I just think, are so chilled, the horses. They're incredible, aren't they? They have to be, don't they? Yeah. But I think part of that, because I think if you did it with a dressage horse, maybe they might not be quite so keen. But I think so. I think part of it is the hacking. I think that the, the event horses are known to kind of be going out and about, aren't they? Do you do a lot of hacking? Yes, pretty much. Apart from carriage driving, that's all I do. Yeah, with mine. Yeah, yeah, I hack every day. Yeah. I like hacking, as you know. I'm very keen on yes. that. Um, and obviously, it's really good for the fitness. And we've got quite a yes. few hills here, so I'm up and down the hills. So, um, as part of this, this hymns in the park that we're doing now, we've been talking to a couple of eventers who know just how important hacking is to their fitness regime for their horses, and that is Matt Heath and Imogen Murray. Well, thank you very much, uh, Imogen uh, Murray, Matt Heath, for joining us for this uh, Bramham virtual Pims in the Park with the BHS. Now, both of you, thank you for taking the time out because I know you're really busy getting your horses fit for the uh, remainder of the competition. Se well, competition season, I should say, really. Um, from your point of view, how important is hacking out when you're getting your horses fit to compete, Imogen? Um, for me, like it's really, really important for a lot of reasons, as well as just getting them fit. Um, we're really lucky here that we live on the top of the hill in the middle of nowhere, really. So we've got a lot of good off-road hacking for the horses. Um, and it's really good for, for fitness and sort of getting them used to the terrain and not just going around on the surface in the school. Because obviously for eventing, you know, we spend most of our time competing on grass. So... It's nice for them not to get a shock that they're not just on a nice sandy surface all the time. Um, and also, I think it's really good for their brains as well. You know, it's, it's pretty boring spending all the time in the school. So for them to go out and actually get to see a bit of the world while also helping them build up sort of strength and fitness as well, I think is really important for them. Now, I know it's going to vary a lot depending on the individual horses and the needs and the level of competition, but what would a sort of typical routine consist of with regards to hacking out? Um, um, yeah, Matt, you can take that one. Um, yeah, I mean, so my, my young horses would, uh, they'd probably hack out on a rule most weeks, probably three times a week. Um, uh, not necessarily uneducated when they're out hacking um they'll still be required to work in the correct way uh but not always in the school and not always kind of do it doing it that way and then the the older ones will will continue to hack out probably three times a week but one of those times they'll be trotting up uh trotting up the hills and and possibly a bit boringly going back down the same steep hill and then trotting back up the same steep hill lion if i'm completely honest he spends most of his time hacking rather than um he hates the school he hates going on the bit um and you know he, he does an awful lot of hacking uh 
he doesn't need to jump too many fences these days. I'm, I've worked out that he knows how to do that. So, for for some of the older horses in particular, I think Hakim can play a huge part in build, keeping their strength up without them feeling like they're overschooled. If that makes sense, and my top horses equally like Max is not particularly fond of the dressage and he doesn't really enjoy being in the school and I think he works much better when he's enjoying his work so actually hacking and working on a hack and, and going in a shape and even going up to doing some lateral work on we have quite a lot of um, single track roads around us so there's not really much traffic on those and you know you can do a bit of lateral work on the single track road you know you can leg your from left to right and you can do a bit of shoulder in even just going down the side of the road and i think for some of those it's quite a good way of getting them to use their muscles and use their their backs and in a soft way without them mentally thinking that they're just in the boring school and that they've got to work really hard and i think that helps for them in their mindset going towards it to doing it um for me sometimes anyway not everyone has the luxury of a school. I know some people find that, uh, for an example, opening a gate can be a good way to practice a turn on the forehand. Do you have any top tips that you could share while you're out hacking? Matt? Um, well, I know you, to be fair, Imogen's just touched on it. You know, we, um, you'll find that a lot of the event riders, when they're out hacking, will, will pop them into shoulder four or they'll move them around a little bit when the the roads or the tracks or whatever allow you to be able to do that um and i think that you know the the other thing that i try to do a lot is is keep transitions um don't always just trot away or um try and sometimes make them work a little bit harder in the trot and then ease off and transitions within the pace uh and also making sure that when you are doing your walk trot transitions and 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 those sorts of things out hacking that they're they're done correctly that they're not just allowed to flop um from one gear to another in a, a in an ambling way you know something i found really useful here as well is being in a really hilly environment it's actually quite a good place to teach them how to do a medium trot because they're much more likely if that doesn't come naturally to them to break into a, a more of a, an extended movement when they're going actually up a hill because it helps their balance than they are yeah. in this when you're in a school where they're likely to sort of run on the forehand a little bit if if they're that way inclined now as all all of us know there's often a very big atmosphere at events i mean the young event halls classes are often held at the big internationals as well aren't they and how would you go about helping the halls prepare for this because in the atmosphere you've got the crowds the flags got plastic bags blown about in the wind you've even got loud commentators like me how do you sort of help the horses prepare for the atmosphere that they're going to face while they're out hacking? Um, it just pretty much sounds like a hack round here, to be honest. Um, you know, we're, we're looking, I think that's another thing where, for me, it really actually helps the horses learn how to deal with that stuff. I mean, we often um, have all sorts of things. Um, we've quite a lot of farm surrounders as well. So we have a lot of farm machinery and they can have all sorts of things going on going on behind them as well or in the fields we have a lot of hedge cutting going on um, down the side of the tracks which is always a fun one and um, for the girls when they're out hiking um and just like you know plastic bags anything that they're likely to see anything flapping we're likely to see that on a hack anyway so if they're used to seeing that every day they're much more likely to cope with that when they see it in the competition environment i find it you know hugely hugely important for the young horses to keep getting them out hacking keep getting them to see as much possible you know just pure exposure and the more you get that into them at an early age the less exciting it is when they get to the top level um, and hopefully become the top horses that we all want and get to Burley and Babington. I definitely agree with that. Hacking especially with the young horses I've always found that for the first time that you can always tell the horses that have hacked on their own the first time they go cross country because the ones that have never been anywhere on their own will often leave the start box and suddenly realise that they've never actually been in an unfamiliar environment completely by themselves. And usually those ones were like, can all, almost be quite nappy or just quite difficult to get going in the right direction. Whereas sort of those ones that I've found that where we've introduced hacking by themselves, where they go out, you know, in, into an unfamiliar, scary, if you like, environment and often cope with that a lot, lot better. And it definitely makes our jobs easier because i don't know if it, for you matt but riding a young horse around its first event is often the most exhausting thing 
that you can do as an event rider absolutely yeah um and you know it, it's about them getting confident in those first few shows and and their confidence gets um installed into them much quicker if they're used to being on their own because by fence two or three you, you normally find that they're actually starting to enjoy it whereas it can take you know if they're not used to going on their own it, it can it can potentially take two or three competitions to get them to actually really enjoy themselves and get going forward cross country so completely agree yeah well uh thank you both for joining us for this virtual brum and uh, pins in the park with the bhs um just final thing really what are your favorite memories of Bramham? I know you both competed there. What really sticks out for you? My favorite memory is the first year I went where I actually got round and <laughs> I've fallen off in the water and all sorts at Bramham. But the first year I went, it was amazing. And I was, it's a really nice and it's a beautiful event to go at. I just wish that I could actually get round the long format there. Well, <laughs> there's always next year. Yeah. <laughs> right um i my my first ride around Bramham was on a horse called grand chaco and it would def that would definitely be my fondest memory it was uh the first year scotty actually took over Bramham, and uh Bramham all of a sudden looked a little bit different than it had done perhaps in the in previous years i've been lucky enough to go and walk there a couple of times and um and then when i was <laughs> going to ride there it all of a sudden looked a damn sight bigger and a damn sight wider um after scotty had got hold of it the first year um i had a, and i had a, it was he, he was possibly one of the most pleasurable horses i've ever ridden um he struggled soundness wise um and had a very short career but uh he had the heart of a lion well i'm pleased to hear it well thank you again both of your image and matt for joining us uh, it's very much appreciated and we hope you get the opportunity to compete on all your horses this season thank you Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Scotty there talking to Imogen and Matt and some um, uh, great tips to take away. And it's interesting to hear how important hacking is, not just, just for the fitness, but for uh, getting a horse used to going around a horse, going around a course even, uh, on, on their own. And they might have to go around some other horses too. Um, but it does reinforce how important the societies work for securing uh, safe off-road roads for us uh, to use, isn't it? It is, and, and also access, keep, you know, keeping these routes mm -hmm. open. I know that there's the big project that the BHS is working on to make sure that, that none of these routes die out, those that aren't, you know, already on maps. So it, it is important, and for me, it's vitally important because the roads where I live are pretty busy, so if I can get off those roads at all, yes. then it's amazing. So let's yes. hear then, Martin, from the BHS's uh, fundraising manager, Eleanor Hashim, and Daisy Cook, who is their access executive, on what they have to say about the BHS work on access. Rideout UK has been going for a number of years now, and I think it's safe to say it's grown and evolved as we have too. Daisy, why don't you tell us a bit about the campaign? No worries. So Rideout UK is the British Horse Society's campaign run throughout England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, which celebrates encouraging riding out and carriage driving, whilst raising awareness of the great work carried out to protect off-road access. The campaign crucially raises funds to improve and create more off-road routes. So events are hosted throughout the UK from small guided hacks to exclusive estate pleasure rides. And we've built up a great relationship with some national trust properties to hold rights on their estates. So um, Wimpole in Cambridgeshire, for example, Mount Stewart in Ireland and Colleen Castle in Scotland. And last year we raised an amazing £35,000. Yeah, I'm so impressed with the figure. You know, you go for a lovely ride and um, raise money for a great cause. You're also giving back to the community and opening up more routes for you and um, people to use in the future. I know me and you, we went to the Stow ride last year, unfortunately not to ride it, but it was just <laughs> stunning, wasn't it? I was so jealous. I really wanted to be on horse because <laughs> not walking around instead. And unfortunately, you know, we are in this crazy kind of unprecedented times and most of the organised events that were kind of planned to go ahead from, from last month all the way through to October, unfortunately, most of them have been cancelled. I, I, I know um, Bramham, uh, our ride out ride in Bramham might still be going ahead in October, but it might be limited. It's also like we're going to have to find out as time goes on. 
um, whether that still is the case or not. But some people can still get involved uh, with Ride-a-thon. Um, so tell us a bit about Ride-a-thon. Uh, so Ride-a-thon is a um, individual hacking challenge um, to ride 70 kilometers or more and raise 70 pounds or more. Um, and you can do this um, hacking locally, you know, taking um, a hack a little bit uh, further away from home, or you can even take part on foot, walking, cycling, any way that you want to get involved, maybe a mixture of all three. Um, yeah, just yeah that's the important thing, isn't it? To say, you know, you don't, I mean, obviously, we all love riding, we all love horse riding, but if you can't get on your horse, you know, you can clap those miles by walking and cycling as well. Definitely, yeah. And some people went over their targets. You mentioned 70 kilometres and raised 70 quid. Anne Atkinson, she was our highest fundraiser last year. She raised £715, which is brilliant. She rode 100 miles of her horse, Ginger, over six days, and that was across Pennine Way. And Jackie Wakefield was our second highest fundraiser from Cheshire, who raised £350. And I really think this lockdown and having the restricted amounts that we can exercise, which is thankfully being eased, um, it's really brought to our attention the importance of rights of way and off-road routes, which people can walk on, or as you mentioned, you know, the bike ride or cycle um, to keep them in, in good condition and, and to be able to use really. Definitely, I've been staying a lot more local and using my um, rights of way here, and they've been really busy, which is great to see. But also, um, it makes you realise that you need that great off-road ride. That's why this campaign is just is spot on, really, isn't it? Because you're raising money for the BHS to then improve or restore or create brand new bridleways and riding routes. Definitely. Since 2015, routes throughout the UK have benefited from the fund, including Queen's Cope in Dorset, which was a crucial link, and it still is now, for um, locals to other bridleways in the area. Um, and the project included creating drainage, then resurfacing, which has resulted in an absolutely beautiful route through the woods. We went to visit the route and it was, wasn't it absolutely beautiful? Oh my gosh, it was such a stunner, yeah. It opened up into a gate with a massive field that you could gallop on and it had the... Um... Castle in the um up the view which was really really stunning it's so beautiful and it's so lovely to see you know the fact that this money that's being raised is making such a positive impact for the people in the community yeah absolutely um another great example um in kent um, a landowner had agreed um to dedicate um, a bride away which is really amazing um but he just wanted some help um to um you know with with the fencing so that he yeah. could fence it off from the rest of his land uh, which we were obviously more than happy to do and um we've had reports from the uh, local bridal officer who says she can see the bride away from her house and she can see horse riders on it nearly every day which is just amazing just to know that those horse riders are now off the roads which we know are, are busy and not as safe as they once were um yeah. so they're now off the roads and they've got that off-road um you know routes to enjoy yeah, I mean, it really is such a brilliant campaign and it's so lovely for people to be able to get involved with and see that their money really is making a difference to riding routes across the UK. If you do want to take part, and we would love you to, um, you can visit bhs.org.uk forward slash ride out UK. Um, it includes how you can uh, how you can get set up um, and also government guidelines on exercising with your course and you also receive support from society. However you take part, remember to plan, ride responsibly, stay safe, and most importantly, enjoy. It sounds like a, a fantastic thing, and absolutely anybody can get involved. I might get one of my big boys doing it. How about you, Lizzie? Yeah, I, I can. The trouble for me is I can't go very far without hitting some really major roads, whereas where you are, because I know that part of the world pretty well, there's some incredible hacking there. I remember my... my <laughs> I remember this is sorry I'm going to digress here but I had this little story my aunt used to put put the ponies in the back of her old rice trailer and she'd just drive us somewhere me and my cousin give us a map and then just dump us and then say and she took me to Bemminster which is I know not too far from where you live yeah. and she just said right girls I'll see you in a few hours and we had to find our way back which is about sort of nine miles to where we were staying which was near Cadstock where we lived oh, and right. 
loads of the loads of the um, tracks were shut and we couldn't get through and we had to jump fences like little hunt fences to get out of fields and oh it was the best day ever and we had a, a little packed lunch on our with our ponies so where you are you know there was i think if you've got the, the access to do it it's incredible isn't it yes there are yeah yeah i mean it's always hairy when you have to sort of link one to another with a road but um some of the roads has sort of remained peaceful but it's uh it, I, don't, I always get worried riding on the road. I don't enjoy it at all. But yeah, there, is, there are there are loads of bridle paths. We're lucky, and they're so far as far as I'm aware. I think they're all pretty well looked after. Certainly, my two are. Only. Well, we cleared them for you about thirty <laughs> years ago. <laughs> 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 Me and my pony jumping up. And down and down. Yeah. <laughs> now let's just talk about Bramham again, because you know I was telling yeah. you it's such a fantastic competition, and and I really love the the competitiveness of it. It's one of the top four stars in the country. And Kitty King, who's a fantastic rider from not too far from where I'm based, she won last year. And uh, we caught up with her and our great friend Dickie Waygood, who, as we said earlier, is the performance manager for Team GB. And this is the two of them discussing her winning round from last year. Hi, Kitty. Afternoon. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks, Dickie. Great to see you. <laughs> yeah, it was quite nice to be catching up um, on Bramham last year, especially with uh, inactivity at the moment. But... Uh, yeah, so winding the clock back um, um, almost a year now, um, this weekend, um, you had a fabulous time. Uh, I, I love Brougham anyway. It's just a, a great event. And then um, I had a fantastic time last year up there with uh, Von Lubiatz, um, Froggy, it's much easier to say. But he, um, yeah, he was superb. He not had a great badminton and it was just wonderful to go up there and kind of put that behind us and um, have such a good spin round Bramham in such lovely parkland. And Bramham itself, um, in, in, in a quick summary of, of, of what the, the competitors think of Bramham. I always think it's one of the toughest four star longs that there is. Um, it's a great track designed by Ian. It's always big, bold, technical, but you know when you go through the finish what type of horse you've got for the future. and. Um, yeah, I always think it's a great indicator on how they'll run at Burley, if you've got that in mind in the future. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you on every level. The going is always superb. The the courses, Ian builds those big, uh, big, solid fences, and but with the big, proper distances. So it makes you ride down to the fences. And as you see it time and time again there as a coach and ex-rider that horses come through the finishing line in really good nick and in good confidence. And the topography at Bramham, um, they they do need to be at the top of the game for the four star lot. Yeah, no, they really do. It's um you know it's very undulating. It actually I found it really suited Froggy because kept him concentrating he's one that his mind can wander a bit because the whole time he was going up and down different terrain um it really kept him focused on me so last year i felt it actually really helped me whereas with some horses it might be a bit more of a hindrance because they lose their balance a bit more they get more tired whereas for him it it really helped me last year and i always feel a little bit you the, the first part of the course nice and flowing forward riding <laughs> and yeah, I think that's your dog in the background. <laughs> Just the green. Um, but the first, but first, um, dogs on leads, please, while you're walking the course. Come on. Um, but the first part of the, the the course and around those sort of top loops really get you going. But you've got to be up on the clock there. But then when you're travelling down the hill to the main water, you you're freewheeling down and it allows their heart rate to to get back to normal again before you've got that intense bit round the back of the track and then you've got to keep on the clock there and be up on the clock yeah because um the last part of the track if you're on your minute markers and you get to that water when you come out of the water and that area suddenly you're you're kind of down it's it takes so much time so there's so many elements um through that um i think it's a dickinson pond um so yeah I, I really tried to be up on my minutes there because i'd learned from last year where i was bang on them i was then down when i came out um so this time i made sure i was well up on them um so i had a bit more room for movement and could just coast home and not be under so much pressure perfect so 10 15 seconds going into the into the last water right why don't we watch a clip Kind of first 
combination on the course. Um, you've got two nice big fences to get into a good rhythm, but then you're slightly running down the hill um, to fence three. So you just need to kind of be a little bit respectful. It's a little bit upright, but it is very colourful, so it helps back the horses off. Um, I had a lovely ride through there. Um, Froggy was, you know, really listening to my aid, so I could set him up quite close to the fence to save a bit of time. Just sit and stayed on the outside line a little bit um, on the five strides, and he um, he jumped through there really nicely. And kind of when I landed, you could kind of take a breath, relax, and um, think, yeah, he's really on on form this this week, and he's listening to me. What was really good for me is is he looked very relaxed through there. And, you know, at the same time, by keeping that outside line, it gave you the room so you could keep a really good rhythm through there. And it's really important, as, especially with the horse that's so scopy in his, in his counter stride, that as early as possible in the course, you get him into that balanced way of going. So, uh, no, very good. Um, let's, uh, let, let, let's move down the track a bit and have a, have a look at another combination. So much harder was not only was it a very steep uh, drop down to the ditch and out um, but it was the fact that you had over a minute nearly of galloping with no fences at all so you know the horses were really swinging along you'd gone up a nice hill galloping along the flat and they were really enjoying themselves you'd really open their stride up and then you had to really condense them back for the coffin I think if there'd been another jump within that minute there would perhaps have been some better rides through the coffin. So it's a really clever fence in that respect. So, you know, I made sure I actually gave the horse a little bit of a setup a little earlier than I perhaps normally would to make sure he was listening. I then kind of rode him on again for a few strides and then I really set him up in his, in his coffin canter. So went down to about thir third gear, but with the impulsion and the revs there. So really got him sat on his hocks, but making sure I hadn't shut the energy down. And then with my upper body, I just made sure I was sat nice and securely, shoulders back and kept my eyes up, really looking at the last part of the coffin um, and really kept my leg on, you know, particularly that last stride of takeoff before the first rail to make sure the horse really knew we were going in there and jumping back out again. No, that, that's brilliant. We were talking yesterday about with the, you know, pure dressage horses and event riders now understanding activating the hind leg, i.e., you know, getting the hind leg a little bit quicker and a bit rounder so you lighten the forehand. And to come to a coffin, you know, when you go down those gears, it's really important that you get the lightness of the forehand so then the horse can come in, he can sit in balance and he can jump in in a way that he lands uh, lands correctly with a leg in each corner. And I think you did a really good job of that. You sitting in balance there, you are then the stabiliser for the horse. So by sitting in balance, controlling the upper body posture, the horse then, in times of crisis, can balance on you. And I thought we did a really good job there. Upper body was good. And I love what you just said about you were actually keeping your eye on the end element. By keeping the eye on the on the last element, that means you're always thinking forward and you'll get to that element. No, good job. I was about 15 seconds or so up on the on the clock, jumping through that water. Um, and I thought he actually went through there very smoothly, very quickly. Um, I don't feel we kind of wasted any time there. Yet by my next minute, I was that then bang on my minute rather than 15 seconds up still. So it's amazing how much time you lose through that water fence because there are so many elements to it and it's quite a twisty technical um, jump to go through. No, I agree. And I, and I think, again, what was really pleasing uh, from my point of view is he was looking for the flags all the way through there. And there was a real willingness to to look, and he looked like a hot knife going through butter. So that comes back a little bit. We haven't talked so much about the weight aids here, but by sitting in balance, and if we look to the right, you know, if a horse can feel a fly on his neck, he can feel the weight of you looking to the right and that weight down into the stirrup arm. When you look to the left, then that will help him get, he'll understand which way he's going to go. I thought you did a great job, but the best bit for me, uh, wasn't actually the water complex. It was when you came out of the water over the duck, you rebalanced him just before the turn, and then you were able to give him a really good ride over the trachana. 
and you see so many people come through the water up over the duck think they've made it and then they lose their balance through the turn and then they give them an ugly ride over the trichina um and i thought you give him a really good ride over there it took nothing out of him and he didn't land too steeply so that was the best bit of me from the water you treated the whole thing as one big combination the last the penultimate uh, combination uh you had a peter of a right through there just tell me what that feels like coming through there and up to the finish line um it was just a, a big relief after not doing so well at badminton and i just thought oh i can ride cross country and we're not completely useless together and um, i was just absolutely over the moon with him but then equally I have in the past fallen off at the last at a four star long having been in the lead and jumped clear and been on up on the time and the horse fell at the last where it pecked on landing so although I was delighted with him and thinking oh, I've just got one more to do I kind of gave myself a little bit of a kind of chat and said well just ride that one properly and don't let him down at the last now um, and then yeah when we jumped that the feeling is you know it's it's a great feeling jumping around those big tracks and having such a, a great ride I think it was probably one of the smoothest rides I've ever had, you know, in my career on any horse. He just really listened to me the whole way around. Um, we didn't really have any hairy or dodgy moments, um, even when things didn't quite go to my plan A, plan B came off really beautifully. And um, yeah, I don't think I've probably had such a perfect ride ever. And he was, yeah, he was fantastic. So it was, um, it was a great feeling coming through that finish. No, really good. And, um, and, and, and uh, no, it was a joy to watch and it was great to be part of that journey. Fantastic, wasn't it? What a beautiful horse. How well ridden. What a combination. But, I mean, they make it look so effortless and perfect, don't they? But we know an awful lot of work has got into that, hasn't it? She's so good with the combination of her and the horse. Kitty, she's just a brilliant rider and it's about the way that the two come together and that's what it's all about isn't it for all of us whether you're just a sort of happy hacker or whether you're an olympic eventer it's it's about that combination and that love of the horse isn't it martin yeah absolutely yeah yeah and you won't get one that can't do it to do something it can't do will you it's just sort of you have to play to the horse's strengths and she's obviously they select their horses for the strengths they have my daughter's new horse is a as a machine she's i've never seen such a smart little mare she you can see her thinking the whole time She's sussing out the next jump, you know, she's brilliant. But that's mares, isn't it? If you get a good mare, they are super good. And someone who has got lots of good mares and has had um, some good mares in the past as well is the local rider to Bramham, Nicola Wilson. Have you ever seen Nicola go cross country, Martin? Yes. She is, she's one of the best cross country riders in the world. She goes, at, one of her particular mares goes absolutely flat out. She's incredible. And Bramham, as one of her local events, is also one of her favorite events. So this is what she had to say about one of her past wins at Bramham. Bramham is a definite favorite of mine. Um, obviously, I, I live in North Yorkshire. It's always such a super, super competition. And I love riding cross country around that park. And it's always a really challenging, but a very exciting and ed educational course for, for the horses as well. Annie Clover is owned by my parents and they bought her as a four-year-old. So uh, to produce her up through the ranks and, and to go and, and, and win at, at our local big event uh, was, was very, very exciting. so much local support there as well and the cheers and and and, um, and clapping and, and it was just lovely at prize giving to uh, to have that atmosphere and it was it was very very special I feel very very fortunate obviously we started with Mr Bumble and then opposition buzz and uh, uh, and the horses that, that we current currently have now but I think um, the firm yard sort of top horse at the moment is Bulana um, she has, has had some super results uh, over the last few years. She's owned by James and Joe Lambert and um, she was on the, the British team that, uh, that won gold in, at Stregon um, Europeans and also we won individual bronze as well. So 
she was um, that was a very exciting moment for us to be there at the European Championships on our on, on the podium. Um, and then we also have Dublin, who JR Dublin, who went to Bramham last year as an eight-year-old. He did the short format there and he really he was superb. He really rose to the occasion. He did like, three super super phases and um, it was just so exciting for us all. He finished fourth and I just thought what a lovely horse for the future. And of course he was aimed for Bramman this year as a nine-year-old to do the long format. So hopefully he will he will get his chance to to shine again soon. That was nice, wasn't it, to hear from Nicola and her her Bramham experiences. And hopefully all the uh, event riders that we've caught up will get a chance to compete sometime this year, we hope and we pray, don't we? Wouldn't it be great? Let's, let's, uh, let's cross our hooves. Um, so the, the British Horse Society would like to say a massive thank you um, to everyone who's given their valuable time uh, to help make this this wee film from the riders, the coaches, the sponsors, event directors, presenters, uh, the film and photography companies. We really couldn't have done any of it without you. And um, uh, uh, we really hope that everybody enjoys the, the, the final product. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, and you then enter yourself into a chance to win a beautiful pair of silver horseshoe earrings kindly provided by Hi Ho Silver. So um, why not check out that, do that survey and maybe win some earrings. Hopefully no feedback on, on us, Martin. Hopefully no, or if it's feedback, it's good feedback about us. Hopefully. Yes, if it's bad feedback, we take the earrings away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everyone for watching this afternoon. And thank you also for everyone that's continued supporting the British Horse Society, because without you and your support, none of us could do the work we're doing and, and, and they couldn't do all the really good work that they're doing for horses. As it says in their little tagline, we want to make horses' lives better. And that's, I know what Martin and I want to do. And that's why we like getting involved with the British Horse Society. Of course, if you want to find out more about the BHS, you can at bhs.org.uk. But back to Bramham as our finale, because of course, any event, has to have the show jumping as the finale. And so let's play out then with Kitty's winning round from last year. But from me, thank you. And thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. And thank you everyone for watching. Laundry Byatt and Kitty King, Great Britain. Kenny King jumps to clear, one second over the 84 seconds allowed, so she uh, completes with a score of 27.2. And they are the winners of the uh, Equitech Bramham International. So, a great win there for Kitty King, all these goes so close at the end of the day. And, uh,
before we go to the prize, we hope you save the prize.